Halo, kembali berjumpa lagi di Right Stock. Kali ini kita di uh, Vienna di CND. LP masyarakat turut memantau proses uh, CND di mana kebijakan narkotika global dibahas di Vienna. Dan kali ini Right Stock kita menghadirkan uh, bintang tamu uh, kawan lama LP masyarakat Naomi Berkshine yang akan memaparkan uh, laporan terbaru Ham Redaksi Internasional Death Penalty for Drug Offenses uh, di tahun 2017 yang baru saja di launch di uh, side event hari ini jadi kita akan bicara banyak soal laporan uh, Ham Redaksi Internasional tersebut uh, maybe you could introduce yourself and a bit about Ham Redaksi Internasional work uh, generally kawan lama saya senang sekali saya bisa bertemu dengan kamu Ricky yeah. <laughs> um, So my name is Naomi Berkshire and I work at Harm Reduction International. Harm Reduction International does research and advocacy around human rights and harm reduction. One stream of our work pertains to ensuring that people who use drugs have sufficient access to harm reduction and health services. And the second stream of our work pertains to the human rights of people who use drugs. Mm -hmm. um, and a, a key intersection of, of human rights and drug policy is the death penalty for drug offences, mm -hmm. um, which is the The possibly the most extreme case mm -hmm. where you see a violation of human rights, mm -hmm. violation of international law, um, and uh, we've been producing these death penalty reports for the past 10 years. Um, there's been, been some good news, some bad news, but, but by and large we still have a problem on our hands yeah. in, the, in the global environment. Yeah. So tell us a bit about the key findings perhaps on uh, your research based on the, this report, this new report that just uh, being launched today. Okay, you can hold for me. Um, so there are 33 countries around the world that still have the death penalty for drug offences on their books. Um, now some of those countries have the death penalty on their books in, in practice. Um, at least nine of these countries still have the death penalty as a mandatory sanction. And that's a real problem when we have no judicial discretion at all. You know, it's one thing to have the death penalty on your books and another thing to have no discretion. There's no ability to reduce the application of the death penalty in these countries with a mandatory sanction. Um, And when you say mandatory, that's automatically, they, automatically these people get that sentence. Yes, the judge does not have an option to say, here is a, a jail sentence, they are required to mm -hmm. impose the death penalty. Mm -hmm. That said, of those nine countries that have the death penalty as a mandatory sanction, three of them are kind of, they have it on the books only. That's Brunei, Dar es Salaam, Laos, and Myanmar. So they have they have a, a, a kind of a soft abolitionist position in practice, mm -hmm. you know, that you don't see the mandatory death penalty mm -hmm. uh, imposed. Yeah. However, our greatest worry with this report is the fact that there is still this extreme fringe of mm -hmm. the international community. There are five countries that have executed in the past three years of our report, and they are China, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Indonesia, mm -hmm. and Singapore. Mm -hmm. um, and these countries are still aggressive. Sorry, Indonesia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As you know, um, these still countries are still aggressively pursuing the death penalty for drug offences. Mm -hmm. um, in violation of international human rights law. Yeah. And presumably the highest rank would be China, but the data is kept secret, right? Yeah. In, in China, the death penalty is so sensitive, it's continue, considered to be a state secret, mm -hmm. um, which means when we do this research, the best we can do is, is, is rely on some NGO-sourced reports. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, this, and this is difficult to verify. Mm -hmm. You know, they are, they're one side of the equation, which we believe are strong sources, but they can't be fully verified. Mm -hmm. So if you, our, our, our research shows that uh, approximately 1,320 people have been executed in the past three years, and, and that figure doesn't include That's China. That's for drug offenses. That's for drug offenses. That's yeah. massive. Yes, it's, it's a huge and unacceptable mm -hmm. number of people that have been executed. Mm -hmm. um, and of this, 90% of that figure mm -hmm. it goes to Iran. Mm -hmm. You know, that figure, as I said, does not include China because we don't have verifiable data. Mm -hmm. But 90% of those of executions for drug offenses happen in Iran. Mm -hmm. And many of these cases are in China. They, they, it seems in the report uh, made by human rights NGOs and UN agencies as well, a lot of uh, unfair trial violations, like maybe includes juvenile or maybe lack of legal assistance. Um, are these also uh, confirmed in your report as well? Well, again, in China, the data is really mm -hmm. scarce. In Iran? In Iran, we do know that um, mm -hmm. the, we have a lot of cases of low-level couriers, yeah. where people who are vulnerable, who are coerced into carrying drugs, um, and then there's a the, the, the justice system which we can't guarantee offers a, a fair trial. Mm -hmm. And all of these things really exacerbate a country mm -hmm. that has the death penalty on its books. Mm -hmm. It really exposes a huge number of people to you know, to yeah. very punitive draconian sanctions. Mm -hmm. 
And apart from death penalty and executions, uh, we've seen massive execution killings in the Philippines, and it's also recorded in your yeah. report. Maybe you could share a bit about the uh, situation in the Philippines as well. Yeah. So when we look at the death penalty and law, we rely on we rely on fair trial and a justice system. You know, mm -hmm. it's state-sanctioned executions, but it, it's within a criminal justice approach. Mm -hmm. You know, when you have a case of extrajudicial killings like we have in the Philippines, things are really out of control because nobody is taking responsibility and there's no accountability. And yet we see from reports, reliable reports from the Philippines, that these are actually state sanctioned. There's there's very little control, but the state is is saying, you know, to the police, go forward and, and carry out shoot to kill orders. And the police have their own people who are, are carrying out kind of, you know, there are masked gunmen carrying out shootings. Um, and this this is extraordinary figures between 12 12,000 and 20,000 people are reported to have been like slaughtered on the streets in the Philippines. Um, you know, we haven't seen violence like that since since the Khmer Rouge, since the war in Vietnam. Um, it, it's it's whole scale slaughter. Mm -hmm. And you know what's most surprising to me is that you know, President Duterte is coming in supposedly to make the Philippines a safer place, mm -hmm. and and yet citizens can't go out on the streets at night mm -hmm. for fear that they'll be shot by a, a masked person sitting on the back mm -hmm. of a motorcycle. And I don't understand how anybody could make that mm -hmm. think that that makes a, a community a safer place. Yeah. And unfortunately, the killings has spread across the region as well. Um, in Indonesia, in 2016, there were 18 people recorded, according to Amnesty International, killed by these drug operations uh, undertaken by police and the National Narcotics Board. And in 2017, uh, LBA Masyarakat uh, documented at least uh, 99 people were killed by uh, BNN and police uh, in these uh, drug operations. Um, are there any hopeful signs or positive trends uh, that you documented in this report? Uh, yeah, but pausing quickly on that yeah. first. You know, Indonesia is a huge and strong country. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in some regards, I'm reluctant to say the Philippines has influenced mm -hmm. Um, these shoot-to-kill orders in yeah. Indonesia, and yet in other ways, you know, there is this political rhetoric that we mm -hmm. see in the newspapers. We see, you know, Jokowi referring to Duterte, and mm -hmm. and we see some kind of echo effect. Mm -hmm. um, we also tracked in our report some worrying developments in Cambodia, oh, wow. where we see a few shoot-to-kills and uh, a, a small, you know, nothing compared to the Philippines, but like in but Indonesia, yeah. a small number of extrajudicial killings for drugs where mm -hmm. we didn't previously see drugs used as the guise mm -hmm. for those shootings. Mm -hmm. To so your question, yes. I, I, we're worried about the ripple effect, and yeah. yet I'm because because there's no causative link, and because every country is strong and independent in its own right. I, yeah. it's not clear, but we're worried about the yeah. ripple effect. Yeah. yeah. And just before the positive trends, uh, President uh, Trump uh, made mm. a remarks on introducing not reintroducing, but um, imposing that sentence for uh, drug dealers. And yeah. He also uh, referred to the Singapore uh, yeah. experience, unfortunately. Uh, you have any comments on that? I have many comments on that, Ricky. Thank you for asking. Um, I, I think this is really reckless. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think Singapore has solved the drug problem, mm -hmm. and I don't think Singapore's punitive criminal justice response has has reduced drug trade mm -hmm. or had a deterrent effect. In fact, mm -hmm. you know, if it so so if a country continues to pursue such an aggressive punitive approach to drugs, and yet they're not seeing any great improvement mm -hmm. in drug trade and drug use, um, I think it's very reckless of President Trump to start talking about reintroducing the death penalty for drug offences in America. Yeah. Um, and, and to endorse these punitive approaches in at an international level, in the media, and, and in such a, in a kind of musing, uh, speculative way, I think is, uh, is, is dangerous from an international figurehead. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So going to the positive notes. <laughs> yes. We, we've seen uh, positive developments mm -hmm. in Malaysia, in Iran, and in Thailand. Um, it, more or less these are kind of small steps towards reducing the application and the scope of the death penalty for drug offences. Um, so in in Iran, they changed the law late last year um, to, to... I'm so sorry, I'm mixing up my, two, my countries. They changed the law late last year um, to ensure that a mandatory penalty is not applied. Mm -hmm. um, and the same in Malaysia. Yeah. Malaysia was previously a mandatory death sentence for drug offences, and, and now they've taken the mandatory component off. Mm -hmm. um, now, it's it's a small step, but judicial discretion will go a long way. Mm -hmm. I think the next step in each of these three countries is ensuring that the law as as changed is applied to those who are on death row to ensure those sentences are commuted, and so that people on death row and their lawyers or get them lawyers, mm -hmm. um, know the process for, for changing it from a death sentence to a commuted sentence or to making the application to get them under the new laws. Mm -hmm. 
So it's good to know that there are positive trends as well in Southeast Asia regions, exactly. particularly yes. uh, Malaysia, Thailand um, are showing some positive uh, progress in the region. Uh, hopefully, uh, these positive trends can continue and have any effects in the regions. Yeah. Uh, so thank you. Yeah, sure. Positive. Uh, just also to note that, you know, before the UN General Assembly special session on drugs mm -hmm. in 2016, 73 countries from around the world, mm -hmm. you know, stood up and spoke out against the death penalty for drug offences. And I think that's really important. Yeah. You know, it is really the tiny minority of countries, the and, and I hate to put Indonesia in this in this yeah. category because you know I love Indonesia. Saya yeah. cinta yeah. Indonesia. <laughs> but it, but it really is a tiny majority of countries who are aggressively applying the death penalty for drug offences. Um, the vast majority of countries stand against this. Okay, so that's it. Uh, our right stock. Um, we have machine now. So quite. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so thank you again, Ayumi, for uh, having with us. Uh, this conversation is very important and if you want to uh, check the report, it's available online on Arm Reduction International website and the website is hri.global, yeah, hri.global, you can download uh, the report, it's very useful. Um, so that's all for our rights talk, we should talk about rights because every human matters. Dadah. Every human matters. <laughs>